Okay, so the topic today, like I mentioned, we're going to discuss the ins and outs of decals versus texture mapping and show you when is a good situation to use uh, decals and then when is a good situation to use complex texture mapping. So let's go ahead and open up Bunk Speed Pro. There we go. So here's a file submitted by Dwayne. And when he joins us on the call, we'll go ahead and introduce him as well. Just to breeze through the file here so you can kind of have a, get your feet wet and have an understanding of what we'll be going over. This is the file that was designed by Thermos. It is a Funtainer, which is the new product line that Thermos is coming out with. And in this file, you see I have just that model. You can go to our Materials tab. We already have some basic materials applied. There are also a couple environments for us to, to go through as well, as well as some cameras that, that have been saved. So we've got some default cameras here, a VR camera, which is a really cool feature I'll go over a bit later. But for now, let's go ahead and dive right in. So Dwayne originally had an, uh, ran into um, a roadblock when he was using decals to wrap an entire graphic around the stainless steel portion of this thermos here. So let's go ahead and show you that step and show you the results of using a decal to wrap around the stainless steel portion of that thermos. So in my materials tab, I'm going to right mouse click and say new decal. Then I'm going to navigate to where that decal is saved on my computer. It's nice when you work in a project, especially if you're using decals, to have a, fold, a decal folder within that project to keep everything nice and clean. So here's the decal here of this OWL graphic. We'll use that PNG. And at this time, it's actually good to remind you to either use a TIFF or a PNG for your decals and make sure that there is a transparent background visible in Photoshop. That way you have just the decal and not the white space around the decal. Hey, Brian, just to, and, just to quickly interrupt, Dwayne has joined us. I, um, you need to convert him to an uh, a organizer, a panelist, so that he can join us and we can ask him questions. Sure. Hello? Dwayne, hey. are you here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Excellent. Thank you for joining us, Dwayne. No problem. Apologize for late entry. Uh, go to meeting wasn't letting me in. So. Oh, no worries. Totally fine. So at this time, we'll go ahead and introduce Dwayne Borowski. Like I said, he's the creative director from Thermos LLC. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, as thank we go through this introduction, uh, we, we have a. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So as we go through this introduction, we have a couple questions for you. So go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and tell us uh, how long you've used Bunspeed. Um, Dwayne Brosky with Thermos, as you guys have mentioned. I'm the creative director here. Uh, we've been using Bunk Speed now probably for a little over two years. Um, we've been kind of limited in our usage and are looking to really ramp up production. Um, one of the main things we're looking at is to kind of be able to visualize graphics a lot quicker from R&D, um, both to sales as well as to uh, retail customers, um, and then be able to provide additional design concepts uh, and iterations um, with much more impact rather than utilizing Photoshop. Perfect. Cool. So that's that's pretty much what you use Bunk Speed for on a daily basis, then. Yes. Yes. Correct. Awesome. So as you've used Bunk Speed for some time now, uh, what if what has become your favorite feature in our software? Uh, the favorite thing that that I really like is the 3D revolves. Um, it's been really helpful for us to be able to build out some HTML files to show the products in full. Um, we used to use traditional photography for everything, um, but then we're limited to the kind of the frontal view or, you know, limited mm -hmm. number of views. So that's been great. Um, and that's why we're really interested in the, the decal process. Um, we have a lot of images online with 360 graphics, but you can only see a partial view of what's on the bottle itself. So by applying the decal and being able to do the 360 revolves, it'll really give us a better sense and a better way to communicate with the consumers um, and customers as far as, you know, what's actually on the product. Perfect. So uh, go ahead and introduce the, uh, the product that we're looking at here, and if you could briefly explain any of the difficulties or roadblocks you were experiencing applying decals. Okay, so th this is a 12-ounce Funtainer bottle. Um, it's mainly utilized as a, a children's or a kid's product. Um, we'll have roughly probably 
60 to 70 different licenses on it as well as some non-licensed graphics. So the OWL graphic that you guys will be demoing today mm -hmm. is a non-licensed graphic um, that was cre created internally here at Thermos. Um, but basically it's a vacuum insulated um, product. It'll keep beverages cold for up to 12 hours. Um, it's got a soft straw spout. So it's just it's kind of one of the flagship um, kids products that we have. Um, and it'll range from graphics from, you know, uh, well, multiple licenses. Sure. I probably shouldn't get into listing any. But um, but the problem that we were having in utilizing the, the decal is we were able to apply, you know, a small decal. So if we wanted to add a thermos logo or just a small graphic, we were able to get that to work. But if we wanted to apply a larger graphic that was a full 360 wrap or a packaging wrap, um, it was only applying probably about a two-inch square to the graphic. Um, mm -hmm. I tried using the decal thickness to expand it, which would expand it around the bottle, but it was distorting the, the graphic rather than doing a, an actual wrap to the product itself. Exactly. So that's actually perfect that's what we're going to discuss today. So once again, thanks for joining us, and thanks for letting us use your file here. No, so no as, as, as Dwayne just mentioned, let's go ahead and show you what a decal looks like as we place the decal on the main body of the thermos and then uh, change the thickness as Dwayne mentioned to make the decal wrap a bit more and see what that hap what, what happens when we do that. So let's go right mouse click new decal once again. We'll navigate to where those decals are stored. And I'm actually first going to drag in the TIFF here to show you what happens if you still have a white background in Photoshop when you save out your decal. So as you see there, I still have the white background around my graphic, and that's because the white background layer was still visible when I saved out the TIFF from Photoshop. So let's go ahead and delete that, and now I'll add the PNG that had the transparent background in Photoshop. Once again, decal is very easy. Once you're, they're loaded in bunk speed, all you have to do is drag and drop onto the surface where you'd like the decal to appear. So there we go, here's our OWL graphic. And in now if I were to change the decal depth here in my materials tab, if I were to ex increase that slightly to try to make the decal sort of wrap around the image, it's sort of doing what I want, but as it gets to the end of the graphic, as I increase this a bit more, you can kind of see how it's not wrapping exactly the way how I'd like it to. It's sort of stretching. And that will become even more apparent when we scale up this decal. So to change the scale and rotation of a decal, all you have to do is select the decal with your material mode up here at the top of the toolbar. And then hover over your object manipulation tools and select scale. Then you can drag the red cube here to scale proportionally. So as you see now, now my decal is about the size that I want but now it's not doing anything close to what I want it to do to wrap around the, uh, the rest of the thermos here. There are some good places on this thermos to use decals, and we'll go ahead and show you how to do that a bit later and where those, uh, where those should be applied. Such flat areas like the little uh, latch here, and then also maybe a, a small text here across the bottom that doesn't have to wrap around the 360 degrees around the, the thermos. So this is the problem that Dwayne was experiencing running into using decals to wrap this graphic. Let's go ahead and show you now how to use texture mapping when we create a, a complex texture map and apply that to the material to have produce the desired result that we're looking for with this OWL graphic. So we're going to delete that decal from our scene. And then at this time, I'd also like to show you how uh, a, a nice little um, file that Dwayne has prepared of this actual decal. So here's our decal here. This is what the main image looks like. And this is what we want to try to wrap across the entire uh, 360 degrees of, of our cylinder thermos here. So this is the image we're working with. And this is what we'd like to, uh, to wrap around the, uh, the thermos. So let's go back to bunk speed now. So to do this, all I'm going to do is create a new material, and that can easily be done by right mouse clicking and saying new material. And I'm going to change this material to a paint. That way it gives me uh, the opportunity to change the color 
and mess with the clear code as well to add any reflectivity to my owl graphic. So now what we're going to do, we're going to load that owl graphic as a color map here within our texture mapping um, options. So in Bunk Speed, you can add a color map, a specular map, an alpha map, and also a bump map. So to add a color map here, all we have to do is double click in the color map square, and that will bring up a window here where we can navigate to our owl graphic. And all you have to do is click open, and now you see that that owl graphic is applied as a color map, and you can actually see a little preview of it here on the material thumbnail. So we'll drag this material onto our thermos container there. And now you'll see that we have to adjust the color a little bit and also the rotation and everything. So to first discuss the color, when a material has a texture or a color map, there's a box here called Blend Texture. So with, with the Blend Texture box checked, it's basically like creating a multiply layer in Photoshop, and that will blend whatever your color map is with your base color. So you, as you see, as I uncheck Blend Texture, you'll see, you'll see that the material is just using the full color map that um, in, in its original form with the white background and exactly how we saved it out. And when I check Blend Texture, you'll see that it's now blending the color map with my base color here. So I can essentially change that texture after it's been applied to our material in Bunk Speed however I'd like. So let's just make that white. And now we can discuss the different types of texture mapping. So now you'll see that it's kind of doing what we want it to do. It's wrapping around the cylinder. Um, but not necessarily in the right way that we'd like it to. So when you click on the actual part here in your viewport with the material already applied, we have some texture mapping settings down here at the bottom of our materials tab. We have different forms. There's a box mapping, planar, and you can choose the different um, axis you'd like to project that on, spherical, radial. So there's a lot of different types of texture mapping. And the best way to describe this is choose the, mo the most appropriate map based off of the primitive shape of your object. So in this case, our, the primitive shape of this object here, our thermos, is a cylinder. So I'm going to choose cylindrical mapping to help map that appropriately. If you have a, more of a spherical shape in nature, you can use a spherical map. Likewise, if you're projecting like a used brake rotor texture on top of a brake rotor, you would use planar since you're just projecting on one plane. And if you have a very complex shape, use box mapping. Box mapping works really, really well in our software. We spend a lot of time making sure that it's quite seamless. Our box mapping seam, you can barely even detect it's less than a pixel. So for this, we're going to choose cylindrical since that is the primitive shape of our object here. And also what I'm going to do is now change the rotation of my, of my color map. And all I have to do is type in 180 and hit enter. And that then orients our color map appropriately. And now what I'm going to do, since it's tiling too many times in the vertical axis, I'm going to unlock the proportion of my color map here so I can change just the vertical axis which is this V here. Now if I hover over the tile which is set to 1, you'll notice that I can click and drag to change that tiling to repeat as necessary. Also what I can do is I can click manipulate texture and that will bring up a nice move widget here for me to move and orient my texture accordingly. So let's go ahead and try to get this about centered, which is about there, and then play with the tiling. And because we, I was working with this project earlier, about 0.66 works pretty perfectly. And now if I zoom in here, you'll see that we're still getting some repetition on the top. So all I have to do is move that up a little bit more. And there we go. So now you'll see that this color map is wrapping perfectly around my cylinder. 
let's go ahead and turn ray tracing on so we can see what we what we're getting. So there you go. Now you, you now you can see where you can where a color map uh, using a texture map would work best as opposed to a decal because the decal really only lets us do about 180 degrees and even that kind of gets a little stretched at the edges whereas if you use a texture map and choose the appropriate type of texture map in this case it's a cylindrical map that wraps around our thermos quite perfectly go ahead and let that res up for a sec Also, if you've noticed, if you're new to 2014 versions of BunkSpeed, we have a new ray tracing mode, which is called Fast. So Accurate is the same type of ray tracing as existed in previous versions of BunkSpeed. When you turn ray tracing on with our old slider switch, that's Accurate mode. Fast is a new mode, which is faster than Accurate and produces incredibly quick results. So if I click fast, it'll just take a sec to res up. And you'll see after a couple seconds it plops in the shadows. And even after almost 10 seconds now, it's completely noise free. So it renders, a, a, a renders faster than accurate. But if you're using more complex paints and metallic flakes and other complex emissive lighting and materials, uh, you won't get the results you're looking for in fast. You still have to use accurate for that. So for this, we can go ahead and keep working in fast. And the nice thing with Bunk Speed's fast um, mode is we have a, a cool in-between mode that kind of keeps the image rezzed up while you're moving it around to help with faster interactivity. And then as I let go, it plops in the shadows. And the rendering is done right about now. So you can get full HD images, which is 1920 by 1080, full HD renderings in about 10 seconds. And FAST only uses one graphics card. So even if you have a, a very basic machine, FAST mode produces incredible results. OK, so now we have that owl graphic wrapped around our container here. Let's go ahead and take it up a notch. And we're going to introduce an alpha map to this texture so you can see what alpha maps look like. So as you see here, when I turn ray tracing on, you'll see that I still have the white coming through of my original color map of this owl graphic. But let's say we wanted to only have the owl graphic itself minus the white shown on our graphic here. We're going to introduce an alpha map. And just like loading the color map, all we have to do is double click in the alpha map square and find our alpha map here, which I created in Photoshop by selecting only the graphic the owls and the branch and the flowers and everything. By selecting that and then selecting the inverse so I can just select that white background and then I filled that black. With an alpha map, an alpha reads black and white and also shades of gray. So in an alpha map, white will be uh, visible still and black will be 100% transparent. So anywhere, let me just open this up for you so you can see what we're looking at. Anywhere where the alpha channel is black is going to be transparent and anywhere where there's white is going to be 100% um, visible. So likewise, if you have shades of gray in between the black and white, you can get some pretty cool feathering and transition effects. So one thing to note, you'll see that I loaded in the color, the alpha map, but the alpha map is still upside down where we originally um, loaded in the color map. A really cool button in Bunk Speed here is Sync Textures. So when I sync those textures, it's going to sync these two alpha and color maps together. So when I change each one, it's going to uh, change the other as well. So let's go ahead and re-rotate this 180 degrees. And as a quick note, uh, if you if you already dialed in your color map, for example, and you just want to match the alpha so it takes on the same properties as the color, if you make sure that the color map is active when you click Sync Textures, it will then match the alpha to that. So it's basically syncing all textures to the active texture. Oh, that's cool. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. 
So there we go. Now we have our alpha map and color map applied to this material. And now you'll see when I turn on ray tracing, you'll see that we now have that depth apparent in our, in our uh, complex texture map here. So that's what an alpha map does. I'll go ahead and check this on and off so you can see the difference of without the alpha map and just the color map. And now with the alpha map enabled, you'll see what an alpha map actually does. So this is great for um, any sort of uh, speaker mesh or grill mesh or any sort of graphic where you want to uh, have some of the material visible, but then have some of the material um, completely um, transparent. So and now we're actually seeing through that surface into the inner surface of the of the thermos there. And again, just to reiterate, the reason we're setting this up here is because this is a valid technique when starting to use multi-layer materials as well. Um, so Brian's going to get into that, uh, just in fact, probably right now, but um, that, that's where we're covering this technique is, is as it applies to multi-layer as well. Yep. Perfect. That's exactly what we're going to do right now. So now that we showed you how to apply a color map and then apply an alpha map to that color map, Let's take it one step further and allow the stainless steel that was originally on our thermos, allow that to show with our owl uh, color map and alpha map on top of it to show how that would look like in real life in production if you were to take an actual you know, um, graphic and wrap it around that stainless steel material in real life. So to do that, I'm going to um, first reassign this material. So now you can see that this is where we started and now what we're going to do, we're going to combine the brushed stainless steel and this new texture map that we have. We're going to combine those two together in a multi-layer material. So I'm going to right mouse click and say new material and we have a lot of material types in bunk speed um, and the one we're going to use today is multi-layer and that's here right at the bottom. So we select multi-layer, and then uh, all we have to do is follow the instructions. It says add layer from existing material, so I'm going to click this button, and then navigate to my base material first. So in this case, I'm going to select my brushed stainless because that's my base material. When building a multi-layer material, always choose the bottom or base material first, and then select more materials to add on top of that. And you can also change this um, uh, size as well if needed, if you have a lot of materials. So there we go, brush stainless, click OK. So that's my base. And now I'm going to click the little plus sign up here to add another material. And this material, I'm going to grab my owls here that we created. We're going to say OK. And one thing to note, you can add up to four materials in a multi-layer in bunk speed. So you can add some pretty complex materials for some really cool, uh, cool, unique looks. One thing to note, always good to name your materials. So we'll call this Owl Graphic. And we'll rename this multi-layer material. We'll say multi-layer graphic. Always good to name your materials and environments and such as you move uh, throughout the rendering in bunk speed. So now we have this multi-layer material created. All we have to do is drag and drop, and there we go. So now you'll see that we're utilizing the brushed stainless material as our base material. We're combining that with our owl graphic that has a color map and an alpha map, and now this is the result that we are trying to, to achieve with having that graphic wrap 360 degrees around our bottle here. Go ahead and zoom in here so you can see what this is doing. There we go. So now you see our graphic here. We have our brush stainless material below. And the nice thing is, is after creating a multi-layer material and assigning it, I can still control each individual material separately to uh, tweak any of the materials that I'd like. So for this color, for example, since alpha channels turned, or the blend textures turned on, you know, I can change this on the fly if I want. I can also change the, the clear coat since I made this a paint. So now you can see that I can adjust the uh, amount of reflection 
on my graphic. So if I wanted something that's really matte, I can take the clear coat all the way down. Also with the brush stainless steel material here that has a bump texture on it, I can change the tiling and the size and the rotation and everything even after I've already applied this owl graphic to it. Okay, and once again we can turn on fast mode as well, which reses up extremely fast. And there we go. So that's how you would use texture mapping using a color map and an alpha map to achieve the desired result of having this graphic wrap around 360 degrees around this thermos. Now we originally tried to use a decal, but because of the amount that we needed to wrap, a decal wouldn't necessarily work in this situation. So let's go ahead and shift gears and go back to decals and show you how to use decals and where they would work in this particular file. So you guys are all pros at this, right? Mouse click in the materials tab new decal, and I created this decal for the latch on the top, double click. Once again, it is a black font with a transparent layer in Photoshop, so I only have the text and I don't have any background. Um, so once again, save out with the transparent background as either a PNG or a TIFF from Photoshop for your decals. So we'll go ahead and select our decal and click scale. That way we can bring up this nice scale tool. Once again, I can drag the red cu uh, cubes here to scale and also this green arc to rotate. Then the arrows to adjust. So as I zoom in here to reorient this and make sure it's nice and straight, there we go. So this is where you'd use a decal for this file here. You'll see that it's nice and flat so I don't, have to, I don't have any of the wrapping issues that I had with the owl graphic wrapping. So that's, that's where I'd use a decal. We can also add a decal to the bottom here. Since um, I don't need this decal to wrap all the way around, since I'm just going to put a nice name here, um, I can use a decal for this. The reason why we use the texture mapping for the owl is because we wanted that to wrap 360 degrees around the thermos here. But since I just want to use about this portion or so for my decal, I can, uh, I can use decals to achieve the look that I'm going for. So once again, right mouse click, new decal, double click to load, go ahead and turn ray tracing off for this. And once again, drag and drop to the surface where you'd like the decal applied. And then we'll go ahead and recenter our graphic here. So once again, green arc to rotate, red cubes to scale, and the arrows to adjust. So let's say something like this probably would work. And now since it's not displaying all my decal, all I have to do is click over the decal depth and slowly drag until I start seeing my entire decal. So there's my entire decal. And you'll notice that as I get larger, if I make this decal larger, it starts to warp here. So if, if my decal needed to wrap 360 degrees around the bottom there, I'd still use a color map for that, a color map with an alpha channel. But because I only need the name to be about that big or so, I can, I can get away with, uh, with using a decal here. So there we go. That works pretty well. Now you'll also notice as I get towards the end here on my decal, it's starting to get a little wider, so maybe I should scale it down just a bit so I don't have any of the distortion at the ends. Something else to note, which is really cool, is once you've applied a decal in bunk speed, you can also apply materials to that decal to change the look of that decal. So let's go ahead and turn fast ray tracing on. And I'm going to right mouse click in my materials tab and say new material. And to stick with good practice, I'm going to call this decal material. And I'm going to change this to, we can just choose a paint for now. 
and I can drag and drop this onto the decal, which is pretty cool. So you don't always have to have your decals 100% designed in Photoshop. You can change the color and bunk speed on the fly. So let's say I wanted to change this to a red. I can easily do that. Or I can use our color dropper to color pick the green of the owl here in our graphic to keep with a nice family of form of colors. So once again, click and drag and hold and let go over the owl. And you'll see that it then changed the color of my decal to the color of the owl. Also, I can change the material type of this decal. So if I wanted to choose a metal, I could get some pretty cool effects with uh, the reflections, very similar to what I'm getting in the stainless steel of the thermos body. So once again, to show you that color dropper again, click, hold, drag, and you'll see that it changes on the fly. So if I wanted to grab that pink as well of the flower, or maybe the lighter teal of the, of the owl, I can do that. So the color dropper is a pretty cool tool to use here in Bump Speed. And because this is a metal, I can change the roughness as well. So you'll see that the reflections are a, a bit um, less sharp when I increase the roughness. But if I were to decrease the roughness, you'll see that I have some nice reflections going on across the name there. I'll let that res up for a sec. Something else that's really cool with our color dropper, while we're actually talking about that, is being able to use our color dropper to select colors outside of the Bunk Speed software. So to show you how to do this, I'm going to reorient my screen a little bit differently so you can see the both bunk speed and this PDF at the same time. So here's my bunk speed file and here's the PDF over here. Let's go ahead and turn ray tracing back on so we can see this uh, uh, sort of res up on the fly. So let's say we wanted to change the color uh, of this pink plastic here to uh, some Pantone color in Photoshop. You can use that or something you found online some really cool color or material that you found through a Google image search. We're going to use that same color dropper technique that we use to change the overall pink plastic here. So once again, click and hold on our color dropper and you'll see it's already changing to the gray of the window. But the cool thing is, is we can drag outside of our software and select any other pixel outside of our software. So you'll see here that there's some pretty cool Pantone chips here that we can cruise through. And since ray tracing is turned on, you'll see it adjust on the fly. And this could be anything. I'm just using the PDF that Dwayne provided. You can go ahead and grab the red here. But this could be, like I said, a Google image search. It could be um, a, a approved set of colors for your, your company or the product line that you're working on. So using that color dropper, you can achieve some pretty cool effects dragging outside of our software. We can go ahead and bring that color back to pink. So we'll go ahead and click the base color here, bring up our color dropper, click out of our software and drag back to the pink. And then we can change the value, the saturation, get it back to something similar to where it was originally, right about here. So that's the color dropper. Just wanted to show you how, to, how powerful, that, powerful that is and how you can click and drag outside of our software. And also, if you didn't note, uh, notice, but you can drag these vertical bars here to change the layout of the UI within Bunk Speed. Let that rise up for a sec. So let's say this is our final image. We're pretty happy with this. Um, with ray tracing turned on, we'll go ahead and now adjust some cool camera properties to get ready for our rendering. So we have our default camera here. Um, I usually typically like to rename this to free and have uh, multiple cameras here um, that I have of my actual renders. 
So to show you how to do that, we'll just go ahead and rename this to free. It's always good to have like a default or free camera to use. And with that free camera selected, all I have to do is use the shortcut for copy and paste, which is control C, control V. And that copy that camera here in our cameras tab. Double click to activate it so I don't mess up my free camera. And I'll call this camera one. So this is going to be my final render camera. This view works out pretty well. We have our press here decal, the Dwayne Borowski decal, and also our color map of the owl with the alpha map applied in a multi-layer material, allowing the nice stainless material to show through. What I'm going to talk about now real quick before we render is this nice post-processing options here. If you're unfamiliar to this feature, we've basically combined a lot of the features that you would use post-rendering in Photoshop, like dodge and burn, um, color balance, curves, hue, levels, all that stuff. We've uh, combined that here in, our, in the BunkSpeed software, so you don't really have to go into Photoshop post-rendering. You can tweak all these on the fly. So we'll go ahead and check Enable Post Process to get started. We can add a vignette. So you'll see the vignette added to the image is kind of subtle there. You can crank that up a bit. And you'll note, which, really, which is really nice with ray tracing turned on, every time I make a change in the post processing there, it doesn't have to, re to, to start res up from scratch again. You'll notice that you can turn ray tracing on, let your scene res up, and then dial in these, these settings here without having to re-res up each time. So these are some of my favorite settings here that I like to use. We'll go ahead and increase the exposure slightly. Maybe the saturation, maybe 1.25 for the saturation to get this ready for our final render. So now when I check this on and off, you'll see this is what we had originally. And then these are the subtle tweaks that we've applied to this camera. Now the post-processing is camera specific, so I can have multiple cameras here with completely different post-processing results. I can also add a color filter, so if I wanted to add like a warm color filter to this image here, I could get like a, a nice orange. And now you can see it's totally changing the, the theme of the image. Same thing with a cool color, if I wanted to have a cool color theme, I could do that as well. So you can get pretty creative with using these post-processing options. And the cool thing is, is once you've dialed in a setting that, you're, that you love or your company loves and you want to use throughout other projects to have a nice consistent look and feel across your renderings, you can right mouse click on, those ca on the camera icon and say save the file. And then you can email that across your team or use in future projects so you can have a consistent look and feel to all of your renders. There's also depth of field. Um, and a bunch of other cool options here in our cameras tab that we'll cover in another webinar. So for now, we have our rendering all set. This is our final image. Everything's good to go. We have two decals and our nice uh, complex texture mapping for uh, the owl graphic. Everything looks great. I can turn ray tracing off and kick off a render. Most of you are pros at kicking off renders, so I won't spend too much time here, but you can change the output mode, also the resolution, and the render settings, which is really cool. So if you wanted to render in preview, which is just this preview mode here, which literally takes less than a second, you can do that. Fast rendering mode, which I said takes about 10 seconds for 1920 by 1080, which is the resolution here. Or accurate mode, which will take anywhere from one minute to three minutes, depending on your machine and how many graphics cards you have. But just to reiterate, fast works extremely well on um, an entry-level machine because FAST only uses one graphics card. If you have eight graphics cards in your machine and you choose to render in FAST mode, it only uses one graphics card. Whereas Accurate Mode really steps up the game to utilize as many GPUs as you have in your machine. So for this, I'm not going to kick off a render, but I'm going to discuss a really cool new feature in Bunk Speed 2014 that you might not be aware of, which is a VR render output. So from the output mode here, the default is render, which is just a basic render. You can render all cameras, or if you have multiple configurations, which we'll cover in another webinar, you can render out all configurations. 
The two new features I'd like to discuss are panoramic and VR. Panoramic works really well for an interior of an airplane, a vehicle, um, interior of a room. Panoramic works well for that um, as it gives you a, a really cool draggable interface to send to other clients or to send to people within your company of a, of a panoramic view, very active that you can click and drag around 360 degrees um, post-render. So VR is what I'm going to talk about now. If you select VR, you can choose the number of orbits around your object. So that would be the number of vertical orbits around your object. So for this, let's choose six. Six works. So that's six levels of orbits around my thermos here. And the number of images per orbit, that's the number of shots around each um, orbit that gets rendered. So if we have six orbits, which is six vertical heights with 12 images around each orbit, six times 12, that's what, 72? So we'll have 72 image, uh, images rendered and compiled into a QuickTime VR. You can also change your start angle and end angle. So if I wanted to start at zero, I could do that, and my end angle at 60. And to show you what the start and end angle is referring to, I'm going to click Save and Close and go back to my camera here. The start angle and end angle simply refers to the amount of incline on your camera. So if I wanted to start at zero, this will be my first orbit, and my ending orbit of 60, this will be my final orbit. And the, our software uh, very smartly identifies the number of, of increments between the start angle and end angle, so you, you don't even have to think about that. So very simply, click VR from the output mode, select the number of orbits and the number of images you want per orbit, and then click Start VR Render. And just to show you what a final version of that looks like, we have it here in our images folder. So in my bunk speed content images folder, these are all of my renders that I have. And a VR outputs a folder of images with the um, executable here, this open. So when we double click here, that brings up in a new web browser our VR image, our VR output. So this is what the VR did. We have a really cool uh, click draggable interface where you can scrub through your model. We can change the, the height here. And it's almost like an interactive 3D file at this point. So you can see the number of orbits that I have. Remember, uh, those are the vertical number of orbits that they stack up on top of each other. And also the number of or images per orbit around our, our model here. And just to show you what the output looks like within this folder here, we have an images folder, and I have 80 images that I rendered at 1280 by 720, so almost HD, using our fast mode, which remember only uses one GPU. And that took only 20 minutes, maybe a little bit under, to render out this entire um, output here. So once again, 80 images in under 20 minutes using one graphics card, and this is my final output that I can then zip up and send to upper management or to a client that they can then open this on their machine and basically have a really cool interactive 3D file to navigate through as well. Cool, so that's a new VR rendering output, which is new in Bunksby 2014. Wanted to bring that to your attention. And to sum up, before we open up for Q&A, we discussed when to use texture mapping and when to use decals, what's appropriate. Decals are great for flat surfaces. They're basically digital stickers. But when it comes time to wrapping something in a very complex uh, 3D shape, that's when you can use texture mapping and control the shape of that texture mapping to achieve the desired results. Okay, Dave, do we have any questions or that we'd like to discuss, or would you like me to show anything else? No, I think this we're, we're at a good time to open this up in case anyone in the audience has a question. In fact, uh, I think Dwayne just asked a question here in the chat window. Uh, on the graphics, it is flipped. Can Brian show how to flip it to the proper orientation? Yeah, maybe you want to repeat that, so rebuild the owl uh, material. 
uh, because by default on this particular model it does come in upside down. And yet that, there's actually two ways you can flip it. You can either flip it with the, um, you know, the interactive widget and just rotate it around one of the axes or flip it based on the texture. But if you recap that, I think that's the first question. Sure. So let's go ahead and apply this material. And we can build that new owl graphic. So once again, right mouse click, new material. And usually I like to use paint or plastic for my decals. We'll go ahead and change the base color up to white again. And double click to load that color map. So we'll go ahead and load that owl graphic. And now you'll see it's here in our color map window. Click and drag it over onto our material here. And the two ways to flip this graphic after it's been dragged onto our, our object here we can click the orientation here to rotate our graphic using this blue axis. Which just to let you know as well, um, to, to reveal the manipulator for a texture, you can also click the button under the texture mapping that says manipulate texture. So either clicking that or activating your, your movement widget in the toolbar at the top, both of those will show the actual widget that you can then manipulate. Exactly. So this button here preloads that move widget for you to use. So a manual way to do this is to rotate holding down shift until I get it to be 180 degrees. So that's a way to do it. And once again, hold down shift while you do that, and it moves in 15 degree increments. Or what I can do is go to the texture mapping controls here under rotation and type in 180 degrees. So that then flips your graphic appropriately. Was Brian, that the, uh, the that answer to the question? I've got one more question on that, Brian. Um, sure. And that would be the, the graphic is still on. It's flipped left to right. So it's rotated 180. But the large owl mm -hmm. should be on the right, the small owl on the left. So there's still another flip. Um, oh, that flip. OK. And that was the question. OK, sure. So to do that, you could either do that in Photoshop um, and flip the graphic. Dave, is there a way to easily do this? I think you could do a negative. I think you could do a negative one on the tile, and that will flip okay. it horizontally. So if we do a negative one, oh, that was of the wrong material. So let's do a negative one, and it looks like it'll it'll work. So once again, always remember to unlock your texture if you're going to be manipulating it in a non-proportional fashion. So there we go. So you can change the time link to negative numbers as well to flip graphics horizontally. Let's go ahead and turn off the post-processing so we can see this a bit better. So once again, the U box here controls the horizontal texture mapping, and the V controls the vertical texture mapping. So just like we did before, we need to change this texture mapping of the V to look like it should, like it did in the Photoshop file. So it was about 0.66. There we go. And that's working quite nicely. And once again, we can apply this multi-layer material that we've already created to this graphic. And once again, we can change that graphic to negative one as well, which I already did. So it started at one, and now we can change it to negative one as well. So the nice thing is, is actually after creating your multi-layer material and assigning it to your surfaces, you can still adjust the texture mapping and uh, the, the color and such. Any other questions, Dave? Not for me, but happy to open it up to the, uh, to the public here. I guess one thing to share is that you can always save out your multi-layers as well. And when you save out a multi-layer material, it actually retains all the materials that that multi-layer references. So you don't actually need to save out each of the different components. Um, you know, you can just save out just the multi-layer. And then when a user drags and drops that multi-layer into their project, they'll get the materials that it includes as well. And maybe you just want to show that. Sure. It's a great idea. So this is my multi-layer material. I'll right mouse click and say save material to file. There's also a, uh, a button here for you to save the file as well. So we can do that. Save the file. And for this, we'll put it in our recent places. Not that one. This one. 
here we go. We'll just put it in this area here. Multi-layer graphic, there we go. We'll save it there. Then I'm going to navigate to where that's saved. So I'm going to bring that up here. Delete, uh, delete the materials in the project. I think it'll be, it will show it more convincingly. So if you pretend that you saved this out and now we're on another user's machine who never had that material, what you can do is uh, just delete the materials out of your project. Just delete all these guys. So yep. this multi-layer material is using the brush and the owl graphics. So we'll delete all those out. So let's pretend that I'm a new user that never had that material. So now you can go ahead and drag the material that the you know you saved out, which is right here. Um, where is it? Where to go? There it is. Multi-layer graphics. So once again, all I have to do is drag this over onto my material or onto my surface. Bunk speed knows it's a material, puts it in the materials tab, and also builds the two graph the two materials accordingly. Yeah, so, so here's our multi-layer material, which was comprised of the brushed stainless and also the owl graphic. So it plopped these three materials into our file. Yeah, so we make it really easy to share not only individual materials but also multi-layer. Perfect. Good call, Dave. Does anybody have any other questions? Or is there anything else to uh, to discuss? No, I think any that was questions a... from the audience from the chat window. I'm not seeing anything. I think that was really informative. Thank you, Brian, um, and thank you, Duane, of course, for your uh, contribution here with the file and with the scenario. I think uh, I think what we covered today is a probably a pretty common question, which is why we wanted to handle that through a webinar so that we can help educate people on the difference between decals versus texture mapping and when to use each one. What are the limitations of one versus the other? Um, so I think we were able to do that, or Brian was able to do that really well. Um, so again, big thank you from us here at BunkSpeed. Does anybody else have any questions, perhaps for Duane or for us, before we close out? Okay, I see one. I see one being asked here. Is there a way to uh, access the recording session? Yes, this is being recorded, and we'll upload it to the community. As we are getting close to the uh, the Christmas break here, it probably won't go live until after the break. But um, we do post these into our community, so bunkspeed.com into the community, and there's a section called webinars, and that contains all our previously recorded webinars. So look out for that uh, there early in the year, and. Um, uh, Bastion's asking, where is the mapping stored? So whenever you save out a texture or a material, the maps are stored inside that material file. So you don't even have to think about referencing uh, particular textures with a file. It includes all of those textures into the file itself. So literally, when you just save a material, it saves everything about that material, including the textures. So we keep it really clean. Um, yeah, it's in the material itself. Wonderful. Okay, and it looks like the uh, oh, there's one last question um, for the hardware configuration. So this is a Rave machine. Rave is one of our hardware partners um, that uh, operates out of North America. Um, it is a uh, single workstation, a high power workstation with four GPUs. Uh, the GPUs are a Quadro 6000 and three Tesla 2075. So those are the um, the uh, Fermi generation hardware. Uh, which are uh, you know the previous generation to what's being offered now. Again, as Brian mentioned before, that hardware is complete overkill for this type of work. Um, I mean that that's uh, that spec hardware is really for doing uh, you know really high end production, large data sets, uh, that sort of thing. So for for something like this, you could easily get away with a single uh, mid to upper range GPU um, to get this this very similar performance that Brian was getting. Um, in terms of CPU and memory, it's a single CPU machine. Um, you know, uh, GPUs are really what drives the performance in our software, as well as most other apps. Believe it or not, um, you know, most apps aren't multi-threaded on CPU, so having multiple CPUs or a, a highly threaded CPU doesn't really matter. So this happens to have a single CPU. And a, a rule of thumb, just for everyone to know, when you're thinking about memory inside a machine, you always want as much memory as total amount of GPU memory plus a little bit of overhead for the OS. So what that means is if you have two video cards and each of those video cards has three gigabytes of video memory, you'd want at least six gigabytes of video RAM, right, because that's the total of the two cards combined, 
plus some for the o uh, OS. We say for Windows 7, you want at least four gigs. So let's say in a single CPU, Windows 7, a two GPU machine, each GPU has three gigs, you'll want at least 10 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, so that's a good little equation to think about when you're setting up a piece of hardware um, you know, to, to support the our, not only our tool, by the way, that happens to, to ring true for uh, lots of other GPU accelerated programs. Um, so he's at, uh, uh, Slava's asking, I have a G, uh, NVIDIA GTS 780, um, and he's asking if that's really bad for the job, and I'd say no. That's a great mid, uh, that's, a, that's actually a high-end GPU, uh, be it of the GeForce line, um, but that performance you'll get on that card is probably very comparable to what Brian just showed, especially in fast mode. You know, again, fast mode is optimized for a single GPU, so uh, as long as it's a... Uh, Fermi or Kepler series GPU, a single GPU is going to give you about the same performance as eight um, GPUs running in accurate mode. So we see average speeds of um, about eight times faster than accurate within the fast mode, again, on a single GPU. And for hard body exteriors, for hard objects like this, fast is just fine. In fact, I bet it would be very hard to see the difference between that image rendered um, in fast versus accurate. Accurate's really good for, you know, headlights, taillights that have a lot of uh, glass thickness, emissive shading, um, you know, lighting panels, fully enclosed interiors or so architectural interiors, um, you know, aircraft interiors, automotive interiors. Uh, that's really where you need the accurate mode because um, it does uh, things to just a higher level, but obviously it takes a bit longer to calculate. The this Camaro VR here was rendered in fast mode as well. So you can still get some pretty good performance with even um, the headlamps and even a car body exterior in fast mode. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, so hopefully that takes care of um, all the questions there, but in summary, yeah, you should be fine with a GTS 780 um, for, for uh, industrial design projects like the, uh, like the thermos here that we showed today. Um, you know, any other average, uh, kind of design level data sets should be completely fine on that hardware. All right, so we're running a bit over, so I'm going to say thank you again to everyone. Thank you, Brian. Um, thank you, Dwayne, for joining. Uh, we really look forward to doing more of these. I know it was a bit of a, um, a slow session today uh, as we get to the holidays, but um, you know we really are aiming to ramp this up as we go into the new year. Uh, and with that said, happy holidays to everyone, and um, all the best as we start 2014. Brian? Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dwayne. And as Dave said, happy holidays.